to First Presbyterian Church. Welcome to our evening service. Welcome to a communion service here. Tonight our theme is relationship and friendship and how suffering brings relationships and friendship in the kingdom of God together. I ask you to stand. We'll begin our worship reading from Isaiah 52, remembering the theme of friendship and relationship brought to us by the sufferings of Christ. See, my servant will act wisely on your behalf. You'll be raised and lifted up and highly exalted, just as there will be many who will be appalled by him. His appearance will be so disfigured beyond any of a man, his form marred beyond human likeness. Yet so will he sprinkle many nations clean. And kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. Let's pray and ask God to help us see and understand the sufferings of Christ tonight. Father, we want friendship, we long for friendship, belonging, to be connected, to not be lonely or isolated. But we want secure friendship. We desire eternal friendship. We seek a friendship that we can't find on our own. We're here tonight as your people declaring that would you find us, would you touch us, would you heal us, would you teach us what it means to be your friend, to belong to you and your family. Lord, may all parts of this worship service teach us more about your great heart and draw our hearts to you. We pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said together, Amen. What a friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry. Everything to God in prayer.
Please be seated. Glad to have Kirk back as the Lord's blessed their family with a new little girl. Leland's got a little sister and we're thankful for the way that God is building this family. We mentioned this morning that Augustine talks about the city of man and the city of God. The city of man is governed by the love of greed. But the city of God is governed by the love of friendship. We're here tonight celebrating the friendship that God offers us in Jesus Christ and the friendship of being a part of God's family. If you're here and you're a visitor, we want to welcome you. We're glad that you're here worshiping and we hope that we can minister to you, answer any of your questions. There's visitor's cards found in the rack in front of you. On the back of that card is a prayer card as the ushers are coming forward tonight. You can fill out that card with a prayer request or if you have questions about what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a member of First Presbyterian Church, or if you just would like to share with us things that we can be praying with you about, fill out that card. We'd love to know how we can encourage you. I do have my name tag on and we're thankful for the nearly 60 new members that joined last Sunday night. 
Members, please wear your name tag and uh, introduce yourself to others who have a name tag on. In all likelihood, that's probably a new member if they're wearing their name tag. And uh, tell them that you'll do better next week. And we're going to take this next four weeks and intentionally focus on wearing our name tags so that we can become a more friendly and welcoming place here and get to know one another. Uh, one other announcement, just a reminder, invite your friends to the Costume Carnival on Saturday. It's built and designed not only to celebrate children and to celebrate uh, our families, but to invite friends to the hot dog lunch. I'm sure you'll love that, but there will be festivities, uh, carnival-like uh, games. Even a magician will be here and should be a great time. So it's on the First Press grounds, 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock. Young adults... MCO students come and run a booth, uh, volunteer, get to know others in the body of Christ. Let's pray now together. Thank you, Lord, that we experience the love, the friendship of family. I pray for those that feel like outsiders tonight, those that feel lonely, those that feel wounded, those that can't seem to find their place. Lord, may you touch their hearts and show us, even as a body, how we can encourage them to experience friendship with you. Your word says, cast all of your cares upon the Father because he cares for you. Lord, we want this to be a caring place where people experience your care. Show us how to do that with people that we meet in our neighborhoods, that we would be true friends in this city. We extend your heart of love to a broken and hurting world. We pray for Lakeside Parish tonight. Bless Zach and Haley Mahaffey, Tina and Luke Nide, their family, Mackenzie Oskin and Stephen Park, Emma and Jordan Painter and their family, Linka and Scott Pomachon and their family, Terry and Joe Powell and their family. Thank you that we're a part of your family. Thank you that you're faithful to grow your family. Use these gifts to advance your work in the kingdom, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to sing with us for the offertory. Sing, Great is thy faith.
continue to sing.
Good evening. We will continue in our series looking at the book of Hebrews. And our passage for tonight is Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 13. If you're using the Pew Bible provided for you, it can be found on page 1864. Again, we continue in our series, and the major theme tying all of these sermons together is Jesus is better. Last week, we were reminded in the previous verses that the great danger to a Christian's faith is not a crisis, but a slow drift of neglect. The neglect of the means of grace, of doing nothing, of running with the wrong crowd, these all lead to spiritual rot. And so last week's sermon was very much an application sermon and a warning not to fall away. And again, this is a church that is under stress, there's opposition, and it could be very easy, as we would imagine, to fall away from being a bold witness and living for Christ. But now, in our passage today, the author moves from a warning moving back to helping us to understand the person of Jesus Christ. So I invite you to turn to that passage, and we'll read it together, and then I'll pray. Hear now the word of God. It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come, about which we are speaking, but there is a place where someone has testified, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him, You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and put everything under his feet. In putting everything under him, God left nothing that is not subject to him. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers in the presence of the congregation. I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I and the children God has given me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to your word and we ask that your spirit would help us not to hear the words of a man, but the living word, Jesus Christ. And as the author has reminded us that the word became flesh. Father, in our time together, may your spirit give us eyes to hear, ears to hear, eyes to see, and in so doing, go away changed, more in love with Jesus, our Savior, our brother, our friend. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I had the opportunity while working as a consultant to get an assignment where I was supposed to interview different leaders in a particular industry. Part of it was to gather information for our client and to uh, distill the information on where trends were going and some of the history uh, that were uh, important to the shape of that industry. Well, I was tasked to interview a man whose family had been in this industry for many generations. And not only was he running a multi-generational family business of some size, but he was also significant in society and in philanthropy. And as you can imagine, it was not easy to get an appointment for him. But eventually a new hired consultant and I got an appointment, we flew out to meet him, and we had to meet him at his office. His office was all that you might imagine a man of such importance to be. He was well appointed and he was actually more personable than we had thought. And he was all business, but he began to tell a little bit about his family story that 
his father grew up with some of the pioneers in this industry and rather when they ran short on cash they would give each other stock well this man was sitting on enough stock to earn 12 million dollars a year from dividends 12 million a million dollars a month doing nothing well all that is to frame, if you will, the man of his stature, power, and wealth. Do you think he would fly to Cleveland to interview with a few young consultants? Of course not. Socially and economically, those who are lesser in stature must go to those who are greater in stature, especially if there is a need. So it was only right and fitting that this young consultant and I went up to him and interviewed him. That's society's natural order. But the writer of Hebrews in our passage today is going to show us that in order to strengthen your faith, you need to understand that God inverts that order. That the lesser does not go to the greater with the need, but the greater comes to the lesser and meets their need. This is the wonder of the gospel. And our main idea that we need to see today that the writer of Hebrews was communicating to his audience was that when your faith wavers, focus on the person of Jesus and particularly his incarnation and all that it means for you. When it's tough to be a Christian, when you feel discouraged, focus on Jesus and in particular, not some abstract theological concept, but the fact that he became in a man and lived among us. So let's look at this passage today. We'll see three things. We'll see a confidence that Jesus is God's plan. We'll see a completeness that the incarnation is God's total plan. And finally, that we are called to be children of God. Turn with me, verses 5 through 8. Jesus is God's plan. First of all, the writer of Hebrews says it's not to angels that he has subjected the world to come. Let's just stop there. What the author is reminding these young believers, perhaps in distress, is that as bad as this world is, there is a better world to come. As bad as the pressures are, God is bringing forth a new world that will be perfect. And they need that hope in the midst of crisis. But then he moves on and he says, he refers back to angels. Look at what it says. It's not to angels that he has subjected the world to come. In our first opening sermons, we saw the mention of angels. And angels were, if you will, a benchmark. Angels are supernatural creatures. They have their own glory and magnificence. And the writer of the Hebrews earlier said, Jesus is greater than the angels. But as great as they are, they will not rule the world to come. And so the author then of Hebrews says, he goes back and there's a place where someone has testified and he quotes Psalm 8. What is man that you're mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and put everything under his feet. The writer of Hebrews gives us, if you will, a very important lesson. When our faith wavers, we need to go back to Scripture. When our faith wavers, we need to go back to God's promises and his plan, his revelation to us on all that is and will be coming to fruit fruition because of who he is. And so the writer goes back to Psalm 8. It's God's declaration of objective truth. And it is a plan that even though Jesus, if you will, became a little lower than angels in the form of a human being, he will rule and he is now crowned with glory and honor. See, he's speaking of Jesus here. The Old Testament, if you will, points to Jesus. The Old Testament says there's this unfolding plan of redemption and it all is encapsulated in the person of Jesus. And look how complete it is. Jesus' rule is 
in verse 8, he puts everything under his feet. And then he goes on and he uses a double negative. In putting everything under him, God left nothing that is not subject to him. See, God's plan is that Jesus will rule. Jesus will bring this reign. The salvation of Jesus brings total renewal that we cannot even imagine. As dark as your days might be, there is a day coming that Jesus promises us. Well, think of it this way. We're entering a season where there are many uh, candidates running for political office, and you hear them throwing out all kinds of plans, right? all kinds of promises. I will address an issue like health care. I will address an issue like economic inequality. And if you will, they're making a plan. If, they will, if, if you will, they're trying to make a promise. But that promise is dependent upon cooperation of others. That promise is dependent upon circumstances beyond their control. And yet God is saying, look, my promise and my plan is dependent on Jesus and dependent on me. You can strengthen your faith with that assurance. See, Jesus is God's plan to repair the breach that sin has caused at all levels. It's not dependent on you or any other person. It's assured, it's guaranteed in the person of Jesus. You can have confidence in your faith because of Jesus. Well, let's move on because there's a completeness. The incarnation, if you will, is the marvel of salvation. It is the total, totality of salvation here. The writer at the second half of verse 8 is very realistic. He says, yet at present, we do not see everything subject to him. Their circumstances are not the ultimate reality. There is pressure. There is challenge. But he goes on in verse 9, he says, we see Jesus who is made a little lower than angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. What's he talking about? He's talking about the incarnation. It's as if his theme is repeated and he wants to emphasize that even though Jesus is above the angels, he took on a, the form and the, the personhood of uh, humanity and became to, obedient to the point of death. And because of his obedience, he's now crowned with glory and honor. It may have seemed like a loss. It may have seemed like a defeat. But Jesus wins. He's crowned. His victory is complete, even though we may not yet realize it now. Look at the humiliation that he suffered. Not only did he uh, incarnate, but he suffered death, a horrible death, a physical death, a spiritual death. That, but he did it so that he might extend salvation to those whom God calls to himself. See, Jesus is the completeness and his incarnation is the completeness of the gospel that God became man. One of the premier airlines in the world has this extensive training program for its cabin crew, the host and hostesses who take care of you when you fly. And in this particular culture, in an oriental culture, one's posture communicates one's respect for the person being served. If you stand above somebody, you're their superior. But if you kneel or get low to their level, you're at their level. It honors them and says, I'm here to serve you. And their training program is that when they come up the aisle and somebody rings that call button, you come down and you bend down so that you're eye to eye with that person who has a need. And in many ways, that's what the incarnation does. It shows that God comes down to our level. God becomes human to restore your relationship with you. He's honoring humanity in a way that no other religious belief system does. He becomes fully human while being fully divine and he suffers a horrible death so that he might win salvation for God's elect. Well, finally, the passage closes with an extended discussion 
that shifts the whole vocabulary of what it means to be in relationship with God. Starting at verse 10, he says, In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. Because of the incarnation, the nature of salvation is not that you are just a, a trophy, something that has been won to God and rescued from the devil, but you are now, if you will, in a relationship with God, and we use the terms of family. In bringing many sons to glory, see, God is restoring the family relationship. We're not just objects of salvation, and if God is our Father, then Jesus calls us his brother. Notice there, too, that he talks about their author of their salvation perfect through suffering at the last half of verse 10. Author there may also be better translated as a champion or pioneer, one who stands for the whole people. We see this in the Old Testament story of David. David was the champion of God's people, right? If David had not defeated Goliath, the God's people would have been put in uh, servitude to the Philistines. But the one man stood for the whole people. So Jesus here is not only the author, but a champion. He is the pioneer. He's the one leading this new humanity. But also, he says, may author their salvation perfect through suffering. Really, what's behind that word there is the idea of consecration for service of the priesthood. Many of you are going through the study in Leviticus, and things must be consecrated, set apart for the service to God. And so by Jesus being consecrated, set apart as a priestly function, we also are to be called priests. And so we have this author and the perfecter of our faith. But notice how deep this goes. This is not just a label. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. Just think about that. For many of us, family is a very sweet, a very safe, a very nurturing place. And even the very best of the families cannot match God's family. For some of us, family may be a very hard word to hear. But God calls us into his family. And he, if you will, through Jesus, calls us into relationship. So much so that he calls other believers brothers. There's a certain bond between siblings that is almost unexplainable. A closeness, even in conflict, a closeness in loss, a closeness in difficulties. There's just something about that shared bond that is unique. More than cousins, more than being married into a family. And yet here, God says, Jesus calls us brothers and sisters. And he sings over us. Look at what he says in verse 12. Quoting from Psalm 22, he says, I will declare your name to my brother. He's going to praise God to us. He's pointing us back to God, not, not uh, just saying, enjoy your salvation. But he's pointing back to God, the author of our salvation. And he will sing his praises. And then he goes on and quotes from Isaiah, two passages from Isaiah chapter 8. I will put my trust in him, total trust in God. And he says, here am I and the children God has given me. It's almost as if this picture of a family portrait together, the big brother, arms around brothers and sisters, joined to him. And so we are now children of God through this incarnation. We are now children of God through this salvation. We are now children of God because of what Jesus has done. So how do we think about this passage? First of all, we need to remember that 
The solution is a savior, therefore our problem we must accurately diagnose is sin. God didn't send an economist. God didn't send a social worker. God didn't send a politician. But God sent a savior because at the root of the problem in our lives and in the world we see is the problem of sin. We needed a savior and we need a savior. And it's a wonderful Savior. It's not just someone who mandates, but it is a Savior who has lived a life that can sympathize with our weakness and yet is without sin. So the first thing we need to remember is that Jesus is a Savior because our problem is sin. Secondly, we need to think about it this way. There are many people in the history of the world and many people in our lives who want to be God. But in all the world's system, there is only one God who became human. That is the uniqueness of the Christian faith. This mystery that Jesus came, became truly man and yet was truly God, is unique. It wasn't that a God just came down and said, let me just see what's going on here. How can I help you or what can I teach you? But this incarnation is one of the foundational truths and unique aspects of the Christian faith. So how do we apply? First of all, Christians, if you're weak in your faith or wavering, first of all, remember that Christ is your brother. He's looking out for you. He's warning. He's gone the path and walking with you. That Christ points you to your heavenly Father, that you were created for this relationship. And Christians, you and I need to learn to live as a son and daughter of God. That's a great privilege. It's a great responsibility because we bear the family name. When you and I go out there, we should live as if we are representing the family of God because Jesus is our older brother. So how do we apply if you're trying to figure things out, you're not yet uh, convinced of the Christian faith? Let me ask and challenge you with this. The two great longings of your heart that God has put into your heart is a desire for a father and a desire for a family. God offers both in a way that far exceeds your expectation, far exceeds any earthly models, the very best, because you were created and designed and are looking for a father and you're looking for a family. And you may say, well, you don't know my history, you don't know my story. That's the gospel. God is pursuing you even when you didn't know it and when you don't know it. He's pursuing you within the hearing of this message with a Christian friend who is praying for you, who has shared a scripture with you. Don't let a day go by without asking one of us here tonight, Eve, what does it mean to be a brother of Christ? Well, my friend and I walked out of that interview with that uh, corporate bigwig. It was actually quite stunning. I don't know if you've ever been around people like that, but they just have a certain air, and, you know, it, it was amazing. And I knew we would never see that man again. There was no relationship established. We had, it was merely a transaction, an exchange of information. And as we got into the car, I asked the younger consultant with me what he thought about the meeting, about the power, the wealth, the social status. And he turned to me, and without thinking, he said, I wonder if he has a daughter. <laughs> you know, he was thinking two steps ahead. If I were in relationship with this guy, I would have the same wealth. I would have the same name. I would have the same prestige. I would have the same emphasis because I would be family. That's the kind of crowd I ran with. <laughs> but it's, it's, if you will, a shadow of what it means 
when we're in relationship with God our Father, we have all the riches in Christ. We have all the status we need. We have a Father who will never fail us and a family that will be true to us to the end. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for the reminder that you not only save sinners, but you call them brothers through Jesus Christ. You call us sons and daughters. That this unique relationship, as we meditate on it, would melt our hearts and see the beauty, the price that Jesus paid, and the wonder of his salvation for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. believers in Christ, we're invited to celebrate friendship with the Father. Communion means sharing. It means participating. It means belonging. It means friendship. And it's because of his sufferings that we might be united to him. It's interesting that to make wheat, you have to crush the wheat into smaller pieces. It has to first be crushed. Wine is, the juices are released when the grapes are crushed. And it was truly the Savior who was crushed that we might have fellowship. Isaiah says that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. This is a family table and it means that our status as we've heard tonight in the sermon, is that of family. Our relationship with God, if we belong to him, will never change. We will always be the Lord's. But he wants more than just relationship and just status. He longs for fellowship, for union, for partnership, to experience, as Paul said, what it means to know him in his sufferings, what it means to know him in his resurrection, that we might share deeply into this life that has been given to us. So if you're a believer, you're invited to deeper fellowship tonight. If you're not a believer, the scriptures instruct us to for you to allow this family invitation to pass you by. But you shouldn't be passive. It's an opportunity for you to contemplate where do you stand in relationship with Jesus Christ. We're also warned, the Apostle Paul says, that if we're running from God, we're out of fellowship, that we should also refrain from participating in the Lord's Supper. That doesn't mean that you're required to be a perfect person to participate. The suffering of Christ tells us that we have failed the Lord. But is your heart to run to him, to be forgiven, to grow deeper in your fellowship? If that's your heart, you're invited as believers in Christ to participate in this table. Join me in prayer as we set the elements apart. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us in substance and giving us status we can have hope we can have patience we can have joy because we have you now residing in our heart through the Holy Spirit in this experience of communion would you take our hearts deeper and deeper into your love 
Transform us. Teach us more about what it means to live in fellowship with you. We pray this, Jesus our Savior, in your powerful name. Amen. That night when Jesus was betrayed, he gathered his disciples in the upper room. And after having given thanks, he broke the bread. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the supper, he took the cup. And after having given thanks, he gave it to his disciples. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for many for the remission of sins. The Apostle Paul instructs us that as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I invite the elders to come. Will you hold the elements until all are served and we will participate together. Isaiah says, he was bruised for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. 
All we like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to our own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. The body of Christ broken for you, eat all of it. And Jesus on the same night took the cup and gave thanks and then gave it to his disciples saying, this is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins.
The writer of Hebrew reminds us, indeed, everything was cleansed through blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. cup is the blood of Jesus Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Join me in prayer. We are so thankful, Father, that we belong to you and you came for us and you continually come for us. You come in your heart of forgiveness. You come in your heart of compassion. You send your spirit to cleanse us, that we might be with you and be reassured in the places where we doubt, where we pull back, where we turn from you. Seal this fellowship to our conscience. Remind us that we are yours. Strengthen us, we pray, all for your glory, all for our good, all for the advance of your work in the world. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. We'll stand and sing together the closing hymn, Yet Not I, Christ Through Me. Remind you that after the benediction, elders and pastors will be here at the front to pray with anyone who desires prayer for healing, for encouragement. You're all invited uh, after the benediction. Will you raise your hands to receive God's benediction? Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you now and forevermore. Go in that assurance. Amen.